All right, I'll call this work session to order. I will start with a roll call. Uh, Mr. Charles Adelton. Crystal Kennedy. Thanks, Alatov. Felix Rivera. Forrest Dunbar. And uh, Suzanne LaFrance is here. Is she in the. I'm sure she'll be back shortly. Thank you. Okay? And then, um, so if you could identify yourself, please. My name is Kate Vogel. Kate Vogel. Wonderful. Well, uh, there's no real formal process for these uh, hearings, but why don't you start by uh, introducing yourself? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Kate Vogel. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, answer your questions today and let you know a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in Lexington, Massachusetts, and uh, went to Brandeis University, uh, which happens to be in the town next door. I studied economics and psychology there. I went to Yale Law School, um, and it was at Yale that I heard about this amazing opportunity to work in Alaska. Um, and uh, I don't think it's that surprising to the legal community here to know that uh, my first introduction uh, to Alaska was as a law clerk. Uh, Justice Dana Fade did recruiting on campus and uh, sold me on the idea, but uh, so too did the experiences of uh, untold number of previous Yale alumni who had that experience, and they sold it as uh, the best year of their life, amazing legal opportunity, but also a chance to have an adventure. So I went to Juno uh, and clerked in my first year out of law school for uh, Alaska Supreme Court Justice Bud Carpenetti. I had an amazing year. I worked on interesting legal issues of first impression, and in my spare time, I learned how to ski. Uh, I learned a little something about fishing, uh, and I got to hike a lot. Um, Following my year in Juneau, uh, I had a job waiting for me in New York City at the law firm of Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed, and I went there. Um, I spent four and a half years at that law firm doing uh, top-level uh, commercial litigation practice primarily, some of it dealing with the fallout of the 2007 credit crisis. Uh, I found that in my spare time, I was waking up at 4 a.m. on Saturday mornings to get on a bus that would take me to ski slopes in New York or even earlier to get to ski slopes in Vermont. And uh, in other seasons, I was going hiking with groups that provided sort of transportation and planning to get some hikes in. So when I decided I was ready to leave New York, it surprised none of my friends there that I was returning to Alaska. Um, I had been visiting Alaska uh, every year that I was gone, and on one of my return visits, I learned that Justice uh, Morgan Christen of the Alaska Supreme Court had moved over and uh, been appointed to the Ninth Circuit, and I wondered if she might need a law clerk. So um, fortunately for me, she did, and I accepted an 18-month clerkship with her in Anchorage. It was my first time living in Anchorage, although I visited during my year in Juneau, and I found it to be one of the most welcoming places that I've ever lived. Even though I hadn't uh, spent much time here, I had a cohort of uh, acquaintances from my prior experience, and they were very welcoming, inviting me to things, introducing me to people. After my 18-month clerkship was over, and during that time, I was dealing with federal issues, both criminal and civil, getting to participate not only in the ones that were before Chambers itself, but also uh, help assist and advise on whether to get involved in some of the most important and controversial cases in the Ninth Circuit through the on process. Um, anyway, after that uh, year and a half clerkship ended, I knew I wanted to stay in Anchorage, and I was fortunate enough to land a job in the appellate section of the Department of Law which I think has to be one of the best places to practice uh, law in the state because the appellate section enables you to jump in on a bunch of different issues and you get to be involved in legal cases uh, at the end, often uh, before the Alaska Supreme Court or other appellate courts. Um, and uh, you don't have to deal with the discovery. You don't have to have one case last for years and years. You actually just sort of get to um, pilot in and... Uh, 
deals with legal issues, present them, think about whether cases should be appealed. And because the appellate section gets to deal with so many different issues, we also were tasked often with weighing in on discrete projects, uh, it, providing advice that maybe isn't uh, related to a legal case, and just getting to deal with a whole uh, wide variety of legal issues affecting the state. It was a joy to work there, and, and my highlights in, in that time uh, were probably three cases, one involving uh, local government somewhat. It was the Ketchikan Gateway Borough sued the state regarding education funding. And the question there was whether the, the required local contribution was constitutional. I defended the state, uh, and our position was that indeed it, it was constitutional, and that position prevailed. Um, which means that local communities remain required to contribute to their local school systems. The, another representative matter was the Wilkowski versus State uh, case, and, and that one was about Governor Walker's veto of half of the PFD. And, and the question before the court was really, was that a uh, legal constitutional use of the veto power? And, a case about uh, various financial clauses in the Alaska Constitution, and again, the, the state prevailed in um, establishing that the veto was constitutional. Um, and then uh, lastly, I wasn't lead in this case, but I had the privilege of assisting uh, in the second round of the Sturgeon v. Frost case, which went to the United States Supreme Court, and uh, that was a case that involved uh, ownership and control over waterways that run through federal conservation system units um, and was a, a joy to work on. And again, the, the state's position, we were amicus in that case, um, uh, but we, we prevailed in establishing state control. And those, that, that's sort of uh, my experience and biography in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, no, for the record, you've been joining Ms. LaFrance and Mr. Constant. Uh, Chris has a question. Anyone else want to get the queue? Thanks. Uh, Chris Constant, downtown, so Chester Creek North, Mountain View, Fairview, lots of interesting issues in the district. Uh, but my question is out of the district. You just mentioned Sturgeon, and of course it raises to me, in my mind, the Campbell Lake question. Have you been following that? Through the chair, um, Assemblyman Constant, uh, only to the extent that it's uh, been in the newspaper. So yes, I've, I've read about it. Essentially, you have uh, a determination made by your predecessor with the state that it is uh, uh, an accessible, navigable waterway. And there are two section line easements, and there are properties built in each of them, houses. And uh, the determination has been made on the north side of the lake that there is an access, but then just this week, I have seen videos of people threatening potential people coming across saying this is private property, that's a private lake, you got to get out of here. And so um, this is an issue that I think is going to continue to rise up until we find a resolution. So definitely something to be digging <coughs> into a little bit. It might not seem like a big thing, but it is important. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Um, sorry, uh, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Along those same lines as what Mr. Constant raised, and I have two questions. Um, access to Chugach over private property is a big issue in our district. Mr. Weddles and I have South Anchorage, Grimwood, and Turrigan Arm. And I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts coming into that situation in this position. And then also, um, what are you most looking forward to in this new position, in this role? the chair, uh, assembly member of France. Um, thank you. I, uh, I'm aware of the, um, some of the access issues, uh, and I'm unprepared to give you a uh, firm answer on sort of what to do in, in any particular case. Obviously, um, there are, uh, ways in which, uh, Public access uh, is something that um, the public is entitled to, and, and there are uh, places where that is appropriate. <coughs> Every uh, in particular uh, private property um, problem is, is going to have its own set of facts, and so I wouldn't want to opine on anything before I've, I've really um, understood it. So I'm I'm aware I haven't personally litigated one of uh, those types of cases in the past, um, although I've certainly followed. 
some of that litigation that has happened. So I'm familiar with how uh, courts sometimes have, have come down on those. And often it depends on sort of the body of evidence that's presented regarding the history of public use of that particular uh, pathway or road. Um, so uh, I'm eager to look into that issue more. Um, as for what I'm most excited about uh, in this position, I think it's the opportunity to serve uh, municipality of Anchorage and to do so in a way that uses some uh, broader set of skills than the ones that I have been tasked with most recently. So instead of being merely responsive to the already existing lawsuits and trying to decide appellate strategy or whether it's a time to uh, abandon or change course on a situation that's already gotten pretty far down the road. Um, I think this role enables me to serve the municipality and its legal needs um, in a more proactive way, maybe address some issues head on before they blossomed uh, into court cases, and it's just a, a much wider scope of representation of the municipality. Thank you, Mr. Friends. Um, Mr. Weddleton, thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I think because you have your um, resume here, you highlight the big glamorous cases, but I, I think you'd be most successful here if you left it. There just weren't any. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really our hope. Um, my hope. Um, so, you know, when we relied on, I mean, my time was Falsey and Becky. And this dough in our code, like, it's amazing how it's called. Dean is amazing. He's got it memorized. But um, I guess that's, maybe that's a warning or something. There's a lot in there, a lot of nuance, as you probably know. And, you know, at our Tuesday meetings, we'll ask a question, and you have that much time to know the answer. So be warned. Mm -hmm. Dean's a good follow Thank you. I have a quick question, and then we've got Ms. Uh, Mr. Constant and Ms. Uh, Dahl. She can go first. Okay. Um, so, uh, how do you understand the relationship of your office to the assembly? Mr. Chairman, uh, the municipal attorney's office, and, and my role in particular, represents the assembly as well as the mayor, um, uh, it, and represents the municipality as a whole. So um, it's an interesting role that sometimes needs to create some firewalls uh, when uh, there are matters that the assembly is presenting to us that are confidential from the mayor's office and uh, vice versa. I, I think that is uh, something that I'm very prepared to uh, step into and adhere to, and I look forward to representing the assembly and the assembly's actions uh, in court if need be, but also helping uh, with the development and ordinances and uh, helping solve problems and providing legal advice um, as necessary. So I, I think it's a multifaceted role running a department and providing advice to both the mayor's office and uh, uh, to the assembly. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Zolotov? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so before Ms. McPherson left, she um, let us know that the salaries of municipal attorneys are not necessarily competitive, at least after a couple of years, and that the state um, get some great, some great trained attorneys um, mid-career. Um, and so one, it's to flag that issue. I, I think it's an important issue. Um, and two, um, just, you know, while there may not always be uh, more money, um, you know, that's government, but what other things could you do or do you have thoughts on to work on retention of, um, you know, your, your season staff? Uh, through the chair, uh, assembly member Zelotel. Thank you for that question. I, I think that the salaries is a huge issue for employees, and I've heard it from uh, some former employees that um, a low salary was a reason for them leaving, and that is disturbing to me. I have been a state employee for um, a number of years now, and, and during the time of budget crisis. So thinking about employee retention, and particularly what to do now that you no longer have as many tier one people. Uh, so we, there used to be uh, these defined benefits that really encouraged people to be civil servants for life, um, or at, at least for you know the huge majority of their career, and, and that reward was built in uh, to the system. There were obvious reasons why uh, the state and municipalities have changed course on what that 
uh, pension program looks like mainly the financial cost, but it does mean that we need to be more creative uh, in how we retain people and more conscious of salaries lagging behind the market rate for the community. So I'm interested in looking at what can be done uh, with salaries specifically and also thinking about other things that help retain people. And that can really include what the work environment is like. Uh, I've seen uh, the Department of Law under different administrations and I know that sometimes the attitude from the top can impact what job satisfaction looks like uh, and that when there are limited levers to uh, show employees appreciation and, and there's maybe less financial room to give out bonuses the way a private law firm might, uh, for example, that it's important to follow up with other ways to show appreciation and, and to recognize people as the professionals that they are. So I look forward to uh, using all the levers at my disposal to uh, try to improve uh, retention and keep some of the fabulous employees that we have, as well as to recruit top talent when we've got good things. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Chris and then Felix. Mr. Rivera. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So following up on um, what the chair had asked earlier and just asking a more pointed question, um, so it was a policy of the previous uh, municipal attorney and Ms. Ennis um, that um, we could go through and work with um, uh, folks at the Department of Law on any ordinances that um, we wanted, uh, that we were working on. Um, is that a policy that you foresee continuing, that we can work directly with attorneys at the Department of Law? Through the chair, uh, Assembly Member Rivera, uh, I absolutely encourage Assembly Members to work uh, directly with Department of Law staff. I, I think there are some procedures in place for how to um, request that that work be done so that we can manage workload and, and prevent duplication of efforts uh, where there are uh, no conflicts, and, and uh, I certainly think that those things help, but uh, there's a lot of expertise in the Department of Law. I think the Assembly can benefit from that, and, uh, and the municipality, therefore, can benefit from it. So I absolutely foresee that continuing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Mr. Constant. Thank you. Uh, three points, probably short. What's your familiarity with the Olmstead Act? And you realize that keeping us out of court is probably one of your big jobs. That's what that role is on Tuesday nights, make sure we don't drop the ball hard. And uh, you've heard about this slightly. Um, well, I'll even put a different spin on it. How do you manage having 12 bosses? <laughs> Dean is amazing with 11. It's un unbelievable. It's, it's amazing he hasn't exploded but, uh, <laughs> or disintegrated somehow. Um, through the chair, uh, Assembly Member Constant, uh, uh, minimal familiarity with the Homestead Act. Olmstead. Olmstead. Act. Act. Olmstead. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's federal law. Yeah. ADA right to community based care instead of institutionalization. Fair enough. Uh, so then, limit, uh, uh, somewhat familiarity, I dealt with some benefits-related cases as a state attorney involving uh, the procedures necessary to um, determine whether someone is still qualified for uh, certain benefits that would keep them in their homes rather than uh, institutionalized. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly familiar with the API litigation uh, and, and some of the really pressing concerns that we have about the, the lack of places for some of our uh, uh, some of our disabled individuals to go to, as well as the people needing mental health care. So I've, I've got some familiarity from that standpoint, but so it's really just a lot you're really tapped into the core of it right there. It's, it's not really a lack of places for people to go. It's that they are literally driving them onto the streets of Anchorage, right? That's the place where people are now waiting for services, is the streets of Third and Carlick, compared to the Gamble Sea and Northern Lights. Those are our waiting rooms for the critical care that people need. Thank you. So then the last one is really different, is uh, the 12 bosses. How do you manage that? Uh, Have you been in that scenario before? <laughs> uh, through the chair, uh, no, I, I have not been in that scenario. I, I think it will be interesting. Um, uh, I have a fabulous 
uh, staff that I know I will be drawing on and uh, learning to delegate with. Uh, I'm going to try to be really communicative uh, about uh, what I'm doing, that I've received a request uh, when I've received it. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think I'll be learning that one on the job. Thank you. Is that everyone? Anybody, any other one questions? One. Oh, okay, Mr. Constant. Are you following the assembly's un seemingly endless increase into the restoral of the, the river salmon stream? Have you followed that at all? Uh, through the chair of the bill, I have right, so You will hear a lot from us. There's, there's federal law involved, state law involved, contracts, tribal issues, fish, and an assembly that has expressed great interest in seeing something happen, but constrained within all those other variables. So this is a project you'll probably hear quite a bit about. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, that's good enough for me. <laughs> any other, <laughs> any other, I had a question, but I'm, it's just a... It's, I'm good. And any, would anyone else like to ask a question? Uh, Mr. Welch. Would you raise a secret handshake? No, but I do appreciate that she, she conforms to the now mandatory policy that the municipal attorney has to go have gone to Yale Law School. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Great. Uh, all right. Well, we have time now for audience participation if anyone would like to speak. Otherwise, we will close the work session. Yes, Mr. Uh, Haberman. My name is Eugene Paul Hairman, Alaska resident for over 40 years, resident of Anchorage for over 20 years, and kind of resident in Matthew Valley. I follow the public process when the public process is an appropriate decision made by the governing body is more like the public interest. Note this law, not the open main event, but the separate state law that says provide a reasonable opportunity for the public to occur. Just prior for me speaking, you heard, well, we have time now. Okay, we can have audience participation. But the preview, you were sitting in the back with respect at the other meeting, and they had no place for public comment. When they violate that law, reasonable opportunity, and there's no opportunity for people to speak, they create a situation is fairness, and they violate the law. So you're walking in, if they appoint you, and it's being recommended, my thought concern is are you going to be part of the problem and not part of the solution? Because the administration assembly has been contempt and indifferent to this those two laws. And that's all I have to say with respect. Thank you. With one minute and fifty three seconds to spare. Oh, just a point. Uh, then it, it's a safety issue. Be careful driving out. There's a lot of wrecks. When coming into the valley, if you go on Facebook or whatever, you'll see a lot of concern out there. So be careful wherever you're driving. Preview of your life to cut this football. All right, this work session is closed.